Greetings, I'm Dr. Kim Yong-jin. Today I'm going to talk about placing aesthetic implants in the upper anterior area. Upper anterior area plays a very important role in a person's first impression and facial profile. It's very aesthetically important. When we place implants in the upper anterior, we need to consider functional as well as aesthetic factors. However, as shown on this slide, there are many limitations in doing upper anterior implant placement. This is easily accessible by the patient, so we need to focus a bit more on aesthetics. And in most cases, this would be immediate implant placement case. We need to anticipate the changes that is going to occur in heart tissue and soft tissue and place the implant in ideal position. As we drill on the extraction socket or as we place the implant, the position of the implant can be deviated from the ideal position. In order to maximize aesthetics in the upper anterior implant case, position is most important. Angulation is quite important as well. In my opinion, the ideal position should be more bodily palatal compared with the inclination of the overall root. In other words, the implant top should be below the cingulum rather the incisal edge. That's most ideal. However, as mentioned, as we do drilling, implant can be buccally deviated. The angulation can change. If placed like this, it is uh, prosthetically negative and it's unfavorable physiologically as well. The thin labial bone, as it becomes resorbed, the implant thread can be exposed or it can be accompanied with a gingival recession. As a result, it will be aesthetically very unfavorable. As shown, TS3 tapered body implant. In the case of it, the top is wider than apex. When we place the implant or adjust the depths, the palatal bone is quite hard and dense. Therefore, implant is buccally rotated. Unless we intentionally place it palatally, as we place the implant, it will be buccally rotated. As shown in the previous slide, it is bound to be angulated towards buccal side. Then it will lead to very aesthetically unfavorable situations. So when we drill into upper anterior extraction socket, we need to make indentation on the lateral palatal wall rather than root apex. Also, as we place the taper TS3, in order to prevent it becoming buccally rotated, side cutting drill needs to be used to expand. By doing this, the wide top of TS3 implant will not be buccally rotated out. When you use taper drill, it needs to be in contact with palatal wall. It's the same as when placing the implant. When placing the implant, it should be in contact with palatal wall. By, by performing these series of actions, the implant top area should be below cingulum instead of incisal edge. In order to do this, I'd like to give you a very simple clinical tip. Use drill extension. By doing this, when you use side cutting drill or taper drill, you can evaluate the angulation of the drill. I make a virtual line which connects the labial surface of adjacent teeth, and if drill extension is positioned more palatally based on this virtual line, then you can make nice indentation on the palatal wall as we continue on with drilling and this will lead to favorably placed implants. When you do drilling in upper anterior extraction socket, it is better to use drill extensions for all drills. If you place the implant as mentioned, there's going to be a gap in between the labial wall. 
you need to manage this gap properly. If the implant is placed too buckly, the amount of this gap is going to be reduced. If that happens, the space for graft material also becomes reduced and we will not be able to make the labial wall around the implant thick. In the end, we will not be able to prevent labial gingival recession, then it will be aesthetically unfavorable. The biggest reason why we need to place the implant palatally is to secure sufficient space for graft materials. When we do graft management, there's this research that is frequently referenced. This is by Botticelli in 2003. It is called a jumping distance. After doing immediate placement, the maximum distance of gap that can be filled up naturally without bone graft refers to jumping distance. On this model, depending on the gap, up to how much natural fill occurs without bone graft was observed. It is known to be 2.0 millimeter. It may differ depending on implant surface, but as for SLA, it is known to be 2.0 millimeters. When we do immediate implant placement, and if the gap is bigger than 2.0 millimeter, then grafting is recommended. If it is smaller, then you don't need to do bone grafting. We also need to consider resorption of labial plate. Jumping distance is 2 millimeter. If the gap is smaller than jumping distance, you don't need to do grafting. However, we also need to consider resorption of labial bone clinically as we all know because of bundle bone theory. The bundle bone is less than 1 millimeter and surrounds the extraction socket and after loss of PDL because there is no blood supply, it becomes resorbed. In other words, 2 to 3 millimeters on coronal side. It consists of bundle bone that is less than 1 millimeter, so it's going to be resorbed. We cannot prevent this. On x ray and CT, if the labial bone top is less than 1 millimeter, we cannot prevent this from being resorbed. How can we prevent the bone loss? Bone loss occurs because uh, there is loss of blood supply after extraction. It's physiologic that we cannot prevent perfectly. If the gap size is less than 2 millimeter, and if we forego bone graft, in the end, the labial plate will be less than 1 millimeter, or in extreme cases, implant thread can be exposed outside the bone housing. As we all know, the ideal thickness of labial bone around implant is about 2 to 4 millimeter. You need to make a space for graft material close to 4 millimeters in order for ideal labial wall to be formed around the implant. If you do this, then the gingival recession will lead to lengthen the crown, but fortunately, by making sufficient space and placing the implant palatally, and by filling in that gap with bone graft material, labial tissue thickness can be maintained. This kind of strategy is what I use frequently. I try to place the implant as palatally as possible, and I make the gap between labial plate and the implant more than 2 millimeter and make sufficient space for graft material to go in. Even then, the thin labial bone will be partially resorbed, but if the thickness of graft material can compensate for it, around the graft material, new bone can be formed. Theoretically, we need to graft internally and externally, but this is only possible Theoretically, in order to do this clinically, we will need to open flap extensively and once graft material is placed also outside the extraction socket and when membrane is applied, it's going to be very difficult to get primary closure. In this case, you may be able to get thick labial wall. However, this is actually very difficult to do so in clinical situations. In doing upper anterior immediate implant placement, the key is to have a gap distance between implant and labial wall of more than 2 millimeters so that I can graft it sufficiently. This will lead to ideal thickness of labial tissue. 
The thin labial bone, even if resorbed, there will be new bone formed around the graft material, so the labial bone around the implant will be at least a 2 millimeter. This is why I emphasize that drilling direction and angulation should be towards the palatal side. Next is vertical position. Due to vertical resorption of labial plate, when we place implant, we need to adjust the depth. When we place in a healed site, we need to place one millimeter deep subcrestally, but when placing extraction socket, there's no reference point. The lingual bone and buccal bone height will be different. We need to anticipate vertical resorption of labial bone. In the case of upper anterior extraction socket, you need to anticipate the vertical resorption of labial bone and adjust the depths. When you do immediate implant placement in upper anterior area, there are some reference points used for depth control. You need to consider marginal gingiva. This is most important. From marginal gingiva to implant the top, the distance should be 4 to 5 millimeters. Marginal gingiva is not a static point. Depending on the recession level of adjacent tooth, it can be very dynamically different. So it is very clinically correct to use marginal gingiva. You may use CEJ, but in that case, in order for CEJ to show similar level as marginal gingiva, the gingival condition needs to be good. If there is a recession in adjacent tooth, you cannot use a CEJ. Depending on the area where implant is to be placed, the most apical position of marginal gingiva should be referenced. The distance between apical position to implant top should be 4 to 5 millimeters. Some say 3 to 4, but I think slightly deeper is better. When you use TS3 pre mounted type implant from implant top to mount driver, the distance up to here should be 4 mm. This should be used as reference for depth control. Healing abutment height. If you use 5.0 mm and if 1 mm protrudes from gingiva, then the distance to implant the top would be 4 mm, so ideal. When placing no mount type implant, you use the implant driver to adjust the depths, and you can use the scale on the ruler. As shown, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 millimeters marked. By using this, you can control the depths. Implant driver can be used, and from the most apical position to the implanted top, if you set as 4 millimeter, then it will be ideal vertical depths. Finally, in order to maximize aesthetics, bone housing is important, but more so, labial gingival contour is very important as well. When we talk about labial gingival contour, this is technique that is frequently used in providing provisional restoration. You need to use a provisional restoration that has emergence profile and cervical contour that can support the cervical gingival contour. As a result, you can prevent the collapse of labial gingiva. If you just use healing abutment right after surgery, then within the extraction socket where soft tissue is open, it will not be accurately sealed, leading to inability to prevent the labial gingival contour collapse. In order to support the labial gingiva just as before extraction, provisional crown that has cervical contour similar to that of natural tooth needs to be provided. That is why I use Austin's temporary abutment. It's very easy. If you cannot use digital guide, you can use this kind of technique. Temporary abutment can be connected after implant placement and the temporary shell that has been prepared ahead is attached to the temporary abutment. And extra orally, you would adjust the contour. In order to support this area, the cervical contour of this area is very important. In order to support it, composite resin is used and contouring is done at chair side. As shown, after immediate implant placement, 
The temporary shell that has been prepared is attached to a temporary abutment and it's removed from patient's oral cavity and at chair side contouring is done. Then if you connect it, that area will be supported. Let me share with you a case based on what I've mentioned. Number 22 crown was fractured. This is pre-op. Labial plate is intact. Immediate implant placement was planned. This is pre-op condition. Gingival type seems very thin. As mentioned, you need to make indentation on the palatal side of extraction socket and by using side cutting drill, implant should be placed as palatal as possible and there should be gap of over 2 millimeters here. Grafting has been done. Grafting should be done up to the soft tissue level and this is called as dual zone graft. Graft is done in tissue zone as well as bone zone. Graft material is positioned at the cervical gingival level and it also provides a mechanical stability to soft tissue after connecting ostium temporary abutment. The temporary shell is attached. In the cervical area, contouring is done to your side. After that, if you connect it, this area is accurately sealed. The graph material does not come out and it is completely sealed off. There are many advantages. You don't need to do suture and the cervical contour that the patient had before extraction can be preserved. This is a occlusal view. A screw access hole is positioned palatally because drilling has been done palatally. This is post-op CT. Graft material is up to the soft tissue level and not just the labial bone top. This refers to dual zone grafting. This is how soft tissue heals after two weeks and if you look at the cervical contour of adjacent natural tooth and that of the implant, there's no major difference. This is post-op three months, and if you look at the cervical contour at the time of final prosthesis delivery, it looks very similar to natural teeth. This is after final prosthesis delivery. This is the implant and natural tooth. There are no major differences, or you can say that the contour around the implant is even more bulky. This is a clusal view. This is two years after surgery. There is a bit of recession in natural teeth, but in implanted, there is no recession. And although the graft material has been applied up to tissue level, there is no signs of infection or peri-implantitis. This is a follow-up CT at two years. This is PA comparison right after prosthesis delivery and this is after two years there's no marginal bone loss and it is well maintained this is ct taken right after surgery and ct after two years as mentioned implant has been positioned to palatally and gap was secured sufficiently if you do graft in that Horizontal labial bone resorption can be compensated. You cannot prevent it, but compensate for it. This is panoramic follow-up up to three years. This is post-op three years. As you can see, around the implant, the gingival condition is much more favorable than that of natural teeth. It's more aesthetically favorable compared with the corresponding tooth. This is post-op three years CT. In doing anterior implant placement, implant position and inclination is very important. When you do immediate implant placement, how gap is managed and gingiva is managed have been discussed in my lecture. In offline master course, if you do hands-on course as well, you'd be able to get a much better sense of it and be able to actually apply it in your clinical practice. Thank you.